بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم the elements of vector x are n independent and identically distributed standard gaussian random variables we are interested in this expectation it is a product of terms raised to the power alpha a real number strictly greater than minus one the ith term is the absolute value of x all divided by the l to norm of vector x the l to norm is the square root summation g from one to n x j squared this product is the geometric mean of those quantities we want to prove that this geometric mean is between 0.36 over square root n and 1 over square root n with a probability that is greater than or equal to 1 minus 24 over 25 to the power n. Let's note first that this product is less than or equal to 1 over the square root of n with probability 1. By the arithmetic mean geometric mean inequality, this product is upper bounded by 1 over n summation i from 1 to n, the absolute value of xi divided by the L to norm of vector x, we can imagine that this summation is i from 1 to n, this quantity here, multiplied by 1. By the cauchy schwarz inequality, this summation is upper bounded by the square root summation i from 1 to n, the square of this term, that's x i squared over the L to norm of vector x squared, times the square root of summation i from 1 to n of 1 squared. This summation is equal to n, this term is the square root of n, the sum of the squares is the L to norm squared, so this square root is equal to 1. This summation is upper bounded by the square root of n, so the geometric mean is upper bounded by the square root of n divided by n, that's 1 over the square root of n. Regardless of the distribution of the components of vector x, with probability 1, the geometric mean is upper bounded by 1 over square root n. For a positive beta, the probability that the geometric mean exceeds beta over the square root of n is 1 minus the probability that the geometric mean is less than or equal to beta over the square root of n. Raise both sides of this inequality to the power minus n over 2. This product becomes the product of the absolute value of xi divided by the L to norm, all raised to the power minus 1 half. We can upper bound this probability using the Markov inequality. The upper bound is 1 over this term, that's beta over the square root of n raised to the power n over 2, times the expectation of this positive random variable, which is this product here. When we obtain this expectation as a function of alpha, we can then set alpha equal to minus one half. Knowing this expectation, we have an upper bound on this probability or a lower bound on that probability. We are interested in the expectation of this function of the random vector x, the expectation of function g of x, in case that the components of vector x are jointly absolutely continuous, is the integral over Rn of the function multiplied by the joint BDF of the components of vector x. In our particular problem, the components of vector x are iid standard Gaussian. So the BDF of random variable xi is 1 over square root 2 pi e to the power minus 1 half xi squared. Because the elements of vector x are independent, then the joint distribution is simply the product of the marginal BDFs i from 1 to n. This yields 1 over 2 pi to the power n over 2 exponential minus 1 half summation i from 1 to n xi squared. This sum is the square of the L to norm of vector x. To solve this integral, we use the spherical coordinates in n dimensions. We change the variables x1, x2 to xn by the variables r, phi1, phi2, all the way to phi n minus 1. r is a non-negative real number. Specifically, r is the L to norm of vector x, the square root of the sum of the squares. Angle phi n minus 1 is in the range between 0 and 2 pi. The other angles from phi 1 to phi n minus 2 are in the range from 0 to pi. Here are the equations relating the variables from x1 to xn to the variables r phi 1 to phi n minus 1. x1 is r cosine phi 1. x2 is r sine phi 1 cosine phi 2. x3 is r sine phi 1 sine phi 2 cosine phi 3 and so on. dx is equal to dr d phi 1 to d phi n minus 1. We should multiply by the absolute determinant of the Jacobian matrix, which in our case here is r to the power n minus 1, sine phi 1 to the power n minus 2, sine phi 2 to the power n minus 3, all the way to sine phi n minus 2. So our integral r is from 0 to infinity. Angle phi n minus 1 is from 0 to 2 pi. The other n minus 2 angles are from 0 to pi. We have this constant. The exponential is e to the minus 1 half times r squared. This is the Jacobian. We also have this function. We take the absolute value of each x and divide by the L to norm, which is r. 
then we multiply. So when we multiply, note that we get the product of the absolute values of the cosine functions. Every absolute cosine is raised to the power alpha. So we have the absolute value of cosine phi 1 raised to the power alpha times the absolute value of cosine phi 2 raised to the power alpha all the way to the absolute value of cosine phi n minus 1 raised to the power alpha. We also have the absolute value of sine phi 1. It appears n minus 1 times. The absolute value of sine phi 2 appears n minus 2 times and so on. So we have the absolute value of sine phi 1 raised to the power alpha times n minus 1. The absolute value of sine phi 2 raised to the power alpha times n minus 2 all the way to the absolute value of sine phi n minus 1 raised to the power alpha. Note that sine phi 1, sine phi 2 all the way to sine phi n minus 2 can be written without the absolute value because the range of those angles is from 0 to pi where the sign is non-negative. We can separate the variables, the integration with respect to r, as r to the n minus 1 times e to the minus 1 half r squared. For the angle phi n minus 1, in the range from 0 to 2 pi, we have this product, the absolute value of sine phi n minus 1, cosine phi n minus 1, raised to the power alpha. We also have a product of integrals over phi g, g from 1 to n minus 2. In each integral, we have the absolute value of cosine phi g raised to the power alpha, the absolute value of sine phi g. What is the power? So when g is equal to 1, the power is n minus 2 plus alpha n minus 1. When g is equal to 2, the power is n minus 3 plus alpha times n minus 2, and so on. So this power is n minus between brackets g plus 1 plus alpha times n minus g. To evaluate the integral with respect to r, we do the substitution y equal to 1 half r squared. So r is equal to the square root of 2 times the square root of y, and dr is square root of 2 times 1 half y to the power minus 1 half dy. Simplifying, we get 1 over 2 pi to the power n over 2, integral y from 0 to infinity, y to the n over 2 minus 1, e to the minus y. This is gamma of n over 2. The integrand in the integral with respect to phi n minus 1 is this function, the absolute value of sine phi n minus 1, cosine phi n minus 1. And this is 1 half, the absolute value of sine 2 phi n minus 1. This function is periodic and has a period pi over 2. We can write down this integral as 4 times the integral from 0 to pi over 2. And over this range, both sine and cosine are non-negative. I write this alpha as 2, 1 plus alpha over 2 minus 1. When the real parts of Z1 and Z2 are strictly positive, beta of Z1 and Z2 is 2 times the integral of phi from 0 to pi over 2, sine phi to the power 2Z1 minus 1 times cosine phi to the power 2Z2 minus 1. 4 times this integral is 2 times beta of 1 plus alpha over 2 and 1 plus alpha over 2. Beta of Z1 and Z2 is gamma of Z1 times gamma of Z2 divided by gamma of the sum. The integral with respect to phi n minus 1 is 2 times the square of gamma 1 plus alpha over 2 divided by gamma of 1 plus alpha. Now to the integral with respect to phi g, g between 1 and n minus 2. Those integrals are from 0 to pi. Both the absolute value of sine phi and the absolute value of cosine phi are symmetric functions about phi equal pi over 2. We can write down this integral as double the integral from 0 to pi over 2. This alpha is equal to 2 times 1 plus alpha over 2 minus 1. This exponent here, n minus g, all times 1 plus alpha minus 1, can be written as 2 times n minus g times 1 plus alpha over 2, all minus 1. This integral is beta of n minus g times 1 plus alpha over 2 and 1 plus alpha over 2. In terms of the gamma function, this is gamma of 1 plus alpha over 2, gamma of 1 plus alpha over 2 times n minus g. Downstairs, we have gamma of 1 plus alpha over 2 times n minus g plus 1 or n minus between brackets g minus 1. The product over g from 1 to n minus 2 is telescopic. We end up with gamma of 1 plus alpha over 2 n minus n minus 2 divided by gamma 1 plus alpha over 2 n minus 1 minus 1, which is n minus 0, that's n. This gamma function does not depend on g. It's multiplied by itself n minus 2 times. We also have gamma of 1 plus alpha over 2 squared from this integral. All in all, we have gamma of 1 plus alpha over 2 raised to the power n. This 2 goes away with that 2. The ratio of these two gamma functions is 1. This is the expectation. Gamma of n over 2 times gamma of 1 plus alpha over 2 raised to the power n. In the denominator, we have pi to the power n over 2 times gamma of 1 plus alpha over 2 times n. This is 2 for alpha greater than minus 1. Recall that from the first page, this probability is upper bounded by this factor times the expectation with alpha equal to minus 1 half. This probability is 1 minus that 1. 
Thus, a lower bound on this probability is one minus beta over the square root of n, all raised to the power n over two. Then we have the expectation with alpha replaced by minus one half. This gives us gamma of n over two, gamma of one fourth to the power n. Downstairs, we have pi to the power n over two times gamma of n over four. We can write down the lower bound as one minus some bracket raised to the power n. Inside, we have the square root of the positive parameter beta. We have the square root of pi. We have the fourth root of n gamma of one over four, the nth root of the ratio of gamma of n over two to gamma of n over four. In the problem statement, the term inside the bracket does not depend on n. So we need to do further simplification by upper bounding this function here, hopefully by a constant that depends only on beta. We can use these inequalities for the gamma function, log gamma of z minus log z times z minus one half plus z minus one half log two pi is non-negative and is upper bounded by one over 12 z. We have this lower bound on log gamma of z and that upper bound, replace z by n over two, replace z by n over four, take this inequality, multiply all sides by minus one, then add this line and that line so that we get an upper bound on log gamma of n over two minus log gamma of n over four, which is log the ratio of interest. Divide by n, we get that log the nth root of gamma of n over two divided by gamma of n over four is upper bounded by log n over four minus log two over two n minus one fourth plus one over six n squared. n is a positive integer. So n is greater than or equal to one over three log two, which is approximately 0.48. So n log two is greater than or equal to one over three. N log two over two is greater than or equal to one over six. Move this term to the right-hand side. We get that one over six minus n log two over two less than or equal to zero. Divide both sides of this inequality by n squared. We get that minus log two over two n plus one over six n squared is non-positive. We can further upper bound this bound by one over four log n minus one fourth plus zero. The nth root of gamma of n over two divided by gamma of n over four is less than or equal to n to the power one over four times e to the power minus one over four. In the lower bound, we have a minus sign and we have this ratio divided by the fourth root of n. We can further lower bound by replacing this term here, which depends on n by e to the minus one over four. Now we don't have n inside the bracket. Gamma of one fourth times e to the minus one over four divided by the square root of pi is approximately 1.59. This constant is less than 1.6. So further lower bound by one minus 1.6, which is eight over five times the square root of beta, all raised to the power n. If we set beta equal to 36 over 100, we get this quantity equal to 24 over 25. Recall that the geometric mean is less than or equal to one over square root n with probability one. So the probability that the geometric mean is between 0 0.36 over square root n and one over square root n, this probability is lower bounded by one minus 24 over 25 to the power n. The lower bound approaches one as n gets large.